Um, good afternoon and welcome to the December 2021 Executive Committee meeting of the Board of Education Retirement System. It is Tuesday, December 14th, 2021, and the time is 1.03 p.m. As a reminder, please note that the committee meeting is being recorded and will be posted to the BIRDS YouTube channel. I'll start by calling the roll. Um, Isaac Carmignani. Present. Thank you. Natalie Green-Giles. Natalie Green Giles. Okay. John Matterich. I'm present. Thank you. Uh, Russell Buckley. Uh, here, present. See, Natalie. Um, Alex, is that right? To, oh, perfect. Sorry, I'm on now. Right, thank, you, thank you. We have a quorum. Um, so the first item on the agenda is to consider the minutes from the November um, executive committee meeting, a summary of which was included in your packets. Can I get a motion to approve the minutes? So moved, Russ. Thank you, Russ. Second. Second from John. Thank you, John. Any discussion? All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Aye, Russ. Aye. Isaac, aye. Right. Any opposed? Any abstentions? Uh, motion carries. Uh, so the next item on our agenda, and I think everybody can see my screen, um, is to go through the annual implementation plans. We will start with the public markets implementation plan. Um, you know, and and last year we were doing the same as um, this year we'll do the same as last year, where we go through the implementation plans in their entireties, um, rather than going kind of piece by piece. Um, I'll start by talking about going through the 2021 public market annual plan. And then saying what we accomplished, what we didn't. Go through in some detail for the things that we didn't accomplish and, and why, and then ask Siegel Marco to give their comments and then walk through the, the 2022 um, public market implementation plans. So, um, first for 2021, um, I have on your screens uh, what we, what the board agreed to, the checklist that we, we came up with. Um, the things that we accomplished are X's, the things that, that were not fully completed are O's. Um, so, um, we maintain the sub asset class ranges in our IPS, and so we maintain the re rebalancing ranges after discussion. The 2 major projects were both completed. The, the asset liability study we completed in May um, and with a presentation to the board to the executive committee in June and approval by the board in September. We also completed the climate change solution studies, um, both for the searches in the, the public markets. Both managers ended up in the pool, um, but we also looked at how to, to uh, added um, additional language into our IPS for uh, on, on climate change. Um, I'll go through. Uh, I'm not going to go through each of the next ones in detail, uh, but just say none of the uh, we had started searches for for all of these except for government passes, but none of the searches were completed um, during this year. And we can go into details on on why in a second. Um, we're reviewing the international equity portfolio construction as part of the searches for the developed market XUS and developed XUS small cap. So those were not completed in, in 2021. So I'll let you kind of uh, talk about the stat. I'll talk about the status of the those um, parts of the plan in a second, and then I'll ask uh, Vanessa and Mike to talk about uh, from their perspective uh, where we'll be in, in, in 20 uh, for these searches in 2022. So the international developed market equity and developed XUS small cap searches were combined um, into one search. A qualifying list was sent to the consultants on uh, November 30th, and due diligence questionnaires will be out. Uh, if they're not out already, they should be out sometime um, this month. Uh, my comments on this, which is the search were pushed back several times, and um, I think recommendations are scheduled for the mid to late summer. The fixed income emerging manager fund to fund search, I uh, believe a recommendation will come to the board in, in January of 2022. And then the government passive search, I believe, is planned for, for calendar year 2022. Um, and I, Siegel has done some work already in, in polling our fixed income managers to do some construction analysis on that. So I'd actually li I'd like to invite uh, Vanessa and Mike to talk about from their perspective, um, you know, what they think about the searches for, for next year and, and where they are in their process and um, what we can what we can expect from the searches that started this year but did not were not completed. Sure. So let me go in the same order as you have on this slide, Antonio. So the international developed equity search were down to um, the candidates. So when um, the Bureau of Asset Management, management issues the questionnaires, 
and we're going to get back a response from those candidates saying if they would are willing to participate or not on this on the search and we move to the next level which is the due diligence on their end uh, the staff and us will be invited to their due diligence we have um, a list of managers that we recommend them and we will then discuss with them what their due diligence ends up being and what they're planning to recommend to the board. Um, I would agree with you that it would probably be a late summer. The reality is that BAM has gone through a number of um, employee turnover, and I think that that has to lead the searches that, that we got started about almost six months ago. Um, in fixed income, everything's ready. Memos are ready, recommendations are ready. BAM just delayed the delivery to the trustees for January. And the government searches, um, it was just not a priority for BAM, and that's why it wasn't, um, the RFP was not issued in 2021. Um, any questions? I think you answer questions. Okay, uh, so, so the, the government passed the search. Does that mean that, you know, because your plans for calendar year 22, if it's not a priority for that now, not really expect it to be a priority for that now. Does he get a Russ, we, we had a little bit of trouble hearing you. Um, I believe what you said is that if it wasn't a priority in 2021, um, is it or will it be a priority in 2022 or will it get kind of pushed off in the same way that it was this year? Yeah, I, would think that, I, I would think that they will do it just because they don't like to delay things for two years. Um, the reality is that you do have every sleeve in the portfolio that has been activated what they wanted with this search was to confirm that they were using the correct passive benchmarks and that nothing was being missed for the overall fixed income allocation uh, but i would say yes it will most likely be done in 2022 as long as there's enough staff to do it i think that the, the issue that we're hitting here ross is that um when there's turnover within the staff at bam searches kind of like really slow down um, and don't 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 continue at the progress um, in the original time. Got it. Thank you for the So uh, another question in, in, to get you guys' thoughts on this um, with regard to and, and I think Sandy brought this up to me earlier in their uh, in their packet, um, technically the contracts for um our international development market equity managers end on 1231 um do you know the progress of the uh extensions or have they talked to you about the projects projects um the um where where are we at with the extension of those contracts no they have not so they've been quiet in terms of extensions not only for any of the asset classes that you have here but in general that's not something that they typically uh, proactively discuss with us. I could have mentioned. So, um, in light of the, those developments, um, again, you guys saw this in packet. This is the 2022 public market annual plan checklist. Um, so, our major projects and searches that that Burris is taking on independently of the Bureau of Asset Management. One big one is the variable tax deferred annuity RFP. So uh, we are in the process, and and Siegel's been a big help, um, in in helping us with the with the questionnaire, um, on uh, you know looking to to bring the variable tax deferred annuity uh, potentially um, in house. Um, right now, as as uh, the board should know, the it is currently managers through the teachers retirement system. So we develop an RFP to um, find an in, uh, investment um, investment platform in custody. Um, global, global listed infrastructure search, um, the notice should go out sometime either this month or early next month. Um, we had talked about this while this is a recommendation that came out of the asset liability um, study. And then looking at the private credit parking place review. So, um, you know, right now we made in 2020, we made the allocation to um, the, the allocation to target allocation to private credit. And that's at 5%. We're currently at 1%. And so uh, right now the money is is mixed between core fixed income, uh, international equity, um, and, and we do have some some cash. And so um, looking to see um, if the parking place is going to be high yield, um, whether or not there's a recommendation to increase um, 
allocations to our current managers, doing look at another manager search in the pool um, or what have you, but kind of reviewing the, that that park place to make sure it still makes sense. Um, I put down all of the the searches from the previous year, um, and they're, they're all going to be extended into to next year, as you heard Vanessa say. Uh, merging manager fund of funds is ready to go. Uh, International uh, developed both the XUS and the XUS small cap will be um, probably late summer when the recommendation comes. Um, the last three are um, part of the the of BAM's um, presentation that you'll see tomorrow. Um, they've asked to extend to to extend the uh, Wellington Midcap and um, SSGA and Global Equity ranges. Um, so the the rebalancing ranges for these individual managers. Um, and then one other thing, and this is part of um, the fossil fuel uh, divestment as that has is completed. Um, doing a review of the the benchmarks um, when we did the divestments in um, kind of the, in, in index in our um, index funds, we chose not to immediately change the benchmarks. Um, you know, we we're, we figured that the tracking error won't be too large, but we should review it from time to time. Certainly, um, we've had questions in high yield where the um, energy makes up a larger percentage of the benchmark, and and whether or not uh, we should change the the, the benchmark given uh, the fossil fuels investment. And so um, that's not something that is um, kind of immediate, but um, as part of the, uh, certainly the alternative credit, um, excuse me, alternative credit um, annual plan. And so we put it on here too, because, and we, we think we should look at um, the uh, effects on tracking error and the effects on, on benchmarks um, across asset classes, not just in high yields um, for the coming year. And I uh, invite uh, Mike and Vanessa to, to add any comments on any of these. Well, I'll just comment on the, the private credit and high yield is, I think, if, in terms of priority is really important because really private credit has done very well. And at the end of the cycle where we are here with rates rising, um, the focus on high yield and whether to use it as a placeholder is important. Um, and then on the benchmark specifically, I know when we went into the divestment process, several of you uh, trustees ask about the effect of, of divesting and keeping the comparison to the prior benchmark was important, at least through this transition. So we could see the effect of our divestment decisions. But as Antonio said, from a other than high yield, from a tracking error and kind of impact number of securities focus on any of the equities from what we've seen both in the active and passive it, it hasn't been a major factor thank you um so any questions from the board on the um what we'd like to accomplish for public markets antonio there was only yes. one item that um the board when the board reviews the sim materials mm -hmm. it, it was kind of embedded in it but mm -hmm. uh, the total active rebalancing allocation is moved down mm. uh, from from 20 to 50 percent of the portfolio to 10 to 25 percent so they're 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 going to be asking for a vote on that okay um as well uh when you look at just the the domestic portion so if you look at on the same materials page 34 okay. on the pdf okay. um that's that's another request that they're they're looking for we're comfortable with the wellington increases of the allocation mm -hmm. um we're a little uncomfortable with the increase on the five percent on ssga top just because those are the largest equity um stocks so it seems like you, you're, they really want to continue to bet on stocks that have gained tremendously over mm -hmm. the last two years um, so that's the only, I mean, it's only a 5%, but we're a little bit, um, uncomfortable there. And we do have emails to them on the total passive allocation, because based on the same materials, uh, when you looked at their actual column, they're over the allocated amount. And if there was no discussion in the materials about rebalancing or bringing that back into range, okay. um, the, the one place where we would be comfortable putting that is into the small cap, WASAC, which is a quality manager. Um, it is right now on the lower, actually it's under allocated, so that it would be a good transition to take some from the winning um, passive allocation mm -hmm. and move it into small cap that has started to turn around. Um, that sounds good. And so, so, but so overall, um, so, can you hear that? So overall, though, but are you all largely comfortable with the um, 
with lowering the the um, rebalancing ranges on on active uh, is, is literally just the SSGA one, but all the other range increases uh, or range changes you all are comfortable with. Correct. Okay. Um, any questions from the board on on the on the ranges and range increases? Um, Antonio, it's Natalie. I don't have a question on the ranges. Back to the uh, top of your slide of the mm -hmm. uh, sort of takeover of the variable TDA. Can you just talk a little bit more about that? I, I know that this has been in the works and it's mm -hmm. the um, impetus is the feeling that there's too much active, too, the fees are too high and too many active managers currently, correct? Yes, um, absolutely, and and think Sandy just stepped away for a second. Oh, he's he uh, he just came back, so I'd like him to, to comment on this as well. Um, okay. Our take was that that our you know we're in our our man our our members have access to 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 two um, uh, different uh, essentially funds in the in the the tax deferred annuity, the variable or the fixed. Um, you know, our take is that you know right now we're paying we can pay less both for the um, the investment management in particular. I think there's a lot to squeeze out there. Um, and even if we end up net net paying a little bit more on the management, which is not a foregone conclusion at all, um, you know, I think we would we would our members would come out ahead um, if uh, we were able to to meaningfully lower the investment management fee. And so the take was to, to take a look, and I think we have a a benchmark where you know if we're not able to meet it, then we stick with where we are. But um, if we're able to a combination of administrative and um, um, investment management fee come out uh, below that, even with a transition, then I think we it would be I think for us responsible not to explore it. Um, and you know I'd certainly like Sandy to, to to add to that. You know it's been a long time. Uh, we've worked on this RFP for uh, a year and a half or more um, before um, finally getting it to a place where we're ready to, to send it out. And so Sandy, I'd like you to comment on this too because it was. It's been something that's been in the works for a while, um, but wanted to, you know, I think we're finally ready to, to launch. Yeah, this is something that uh, we began to contemplate even before Antonio came on board. Um, Natalie, you and Russell are familiar with the, it's not really a showdown, but in the conversation about how long ago was that now, over two years ago, uh, where John Adler led the charge and we actually supported the argument that we thought they had too many active managers, we thought their fees were too high, and we thought their performance was substandard. Um, the, uh, the conversation went directly opposite what I would have predicted because the data was so strong. And um, Rokatan continues to recommend additional managers in the face of what we believe is clear underperformance, even though, you know, I, I'll be honest with you, when when Rokatan proposed their new heat map analysis of underperforming managers, they used a very peculiar definition for a benchmark. Their benchmark for each individual manager was quote unquote expected return, not alternative investment opportunity, which is what we believe we can fix and, um, you know, conditioned on the, any political blowback that TRS has over this, um, I fully expect we will be exiting TRS's management and improving both returns and expenses. And what what is the um, um, FERS membership asset you know, what's the total right now in the TDA? It's about 600 million. Okay. And that's, you know, it, it, it is dwarfed that's by the small, fixed. That's a very small percentage of the total mm -hmm. holding, so. Yeah, they should be indifferent. Yeah, to, that's, to that's that, what. I think last time I checked, it was it 18 billion in? Um, it, <laughs> I think, uh, I think I have the new slides in my yeah. inbox right now, so yes. It's a massive, yeah. So we, you know, from we wouldn't cause any interruptions with regard to fee breaks or anything like that. We are you know, a very, very, very small percentage. So, right. Uh, okay. Business. In fact, they might like us not coming to the meetings anymore. <laughs> There's that. <laughs> so, 
but you know, like I said, we we have a bogey to hit, um, and and we we'll be forthright on if if we don't, right? If for whatever reason the the combination of, um, transition investment management and administrative expenses exceeds, then you know it's right in the RFP that we this this does not necessarily have to lead to a a, a, um, a procurement. Got it. Okay, thank you. And I, I assume the uh, the number of choices available. I think there are about six different funds right now in the TDA. We would attempt to give similar choices, or would we narrow that? In the beginning, well, Sydney, I don't know if you want to go ahead. Well, yeah. I actually, I I have to, uh, I, I just have to jump in real quick that this is. Uh, th the the one variable unit is fixed in our rules and regulations so right. it would need extensive uh, i think it would need extensive revision to uh, to change that um there would also be a technological a very significant technological impact on this because cpms is also based around the concept of one unified variable unit um so there would be this is absolutely doable but it you know, I think that it should be decoupled from the idea of who manages the funds. It's definitely a longer term, um, a bigger lift. Yep. For a couple of exactly. different reasons. Okay, I appreciate that insight. Thank you. Uh, can I also add just as because Antonio has run the uh, RFP by by me, and I think there's two aspects that underlie this. The first is that. If you see everything going on in the marketplace for these kind of plans, fee reviews and performance reviews have become an intense focus of the <laughs> the legal and, and regulatory uh, oversight of public plans. So this first step where we're identifying, as Antonio called it, the platform so we can address all these other questions that, that have been raised is really the critical first step. And, and I, I think even that's going to start to lower your expenses and you'll you'll be on the right track just by getting a better platform. And, you know, I think the 1 other aspect to all this is. Governance, right? And obviously, you know, and, and we've been working on the RFP. Um, you know, kind of internally, but the reason I put it on the major projects and searches this time around, is because. What it means for the governance of from this board and the executive committee going forward, which is. If we're taking it from TRS where they're and, and bring it internally, then this becomes another responsibility ultimately of this board. Um, and so that's why I think the time is now to, to you know, again, we, after we've worked it and worked it, um, and got into a place where we think it's ready, um, letting you know, folks know that it's on the horizon because once the selection is made and the implementation, it is now under the purview of this board. Um, and, and then, you know, so kind of all that entails consulting, legal and things like that. So we, we do have to, um, you know, now get them to say this is, the people on this board will start to see more of that information. So this is and um, other questions because like I said, this is all this is just kind of the general review. Well, obviously, the 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 at least for this next go around, the the full board will have to approve. Um, you know, we'll see and on the sixteenth is whether or not that that's the case forever. But um, uh, and one thing I'll do, thank, and thanks to Vanessa for for adding in. I have one more thing to add to the rebalancing ranges and benchmarks, like she said, which is the um, the uh, lowering of the ranges for active management and domestic equities. Um, other questions, then we can go on to thanks to to the folks at Siegel. Um, uh, next, we're going to go through Antonio. the yes, absolutely, Russ. Oops. One one quick and minor question. I know we did the asset liability study. And this year in 2021, uh, the next we're trying to plan the next one would be what 2023, 24, 25. Um, so we put in in the the IPS is every three years. So the okay. um, next one would be 2024. But we also said we could do it more frequently. Um, we'll certainly review um, uh, sure. next year. We do it kind of every year, and you know, see who comes out with their capital market assumptions and things like that. But yeah, we won't do a full study. Uh, it's not due until 2024. Understood. Thank you. Um, all right, now uh, wanted to go through uh, the 2021 private market annual plan. Um, you know, we'll go through again the things that we were able to accomplish and the the things that we were not. Um, so, seven percent assumed rate of return. We're still the only system that uses seven percent for our um, assumptions for pacing. Um, the other system used five percent. 
Um, we were able for our target commitment in private equity on uh, the primary program. Um, we did not hit 250 million dollars. We got into range, but I'm still using that as a circle to kind of give the explanation on why uh, the emerging manager program is not one that the, the board has a direct um, approval of, but we did hit the 25 million there. Um, all the other private market asset classes, we hit our targets or hit or exceeded our targets. So for real estate, for opportunistic fixed income, private credit, and for infrastructure. Um, last year, we'd put on, you know, we would develop a high conviction list and have 46 independent recommendations. That did not come to fruition for the independent recommendations. Um, you guys can, can, can know why, but I could go to that in a bit more detail. So I'll go through the things that, again, we, we um, were not able to accomplish. Um, in, in 2021, and then I'll, I'll turn it over to um, Matt uh, from Axie to kind of talk through the, his, his take on those issues before we go into the 2022 plan. And just as a reminder, um, this is including the proposed commitments. I'm using just the primary programs, the ones that the board has um, purview over. That um, for OFI will be at 190 million this year uh, above the target. Infrastructure 147, again, above the target. Um, and real estate with the uh, proposed commitment that you'll be seeing um, today and on the 16th, we'll get to $249 million. Um, we had a $250 million private equity um, target with a plus or minus 63 million. So we hit the plus or minus 63. We'll be at 188, um, although we there is some a, a, a one change that we'll talk about in executive session on the complexion of that. But uh, that is the one area we were not able to, to, to hit our targets. And so um, going through the review, um, again, the private equity, it was in range, but we passed on two funds. We passed on areas and we passed on center bridge and those two funds would have gotten us a target. Um, and so just, you know, to, to, to be frank about that, but, um, uh, always working on how do we balance, um, you know, getting to, to target and portfolio construction asset allocation with our conviction in a particular manager, um, independent selections. Uh, we have independent searches and recommendations ready for December, 2021. Uh, so you'll hear about, uh, one of them shortly. Um, and then, in addition, um, we, we have, uh, the global listed infrastructure search that'll be coming out and then we're, we'll, you know, once those two pass, we'll have a few more. Um, and overall, we do have several targets, um, based on the ALM study. And so that's, where we're going to spend most of our time. We're thinking about independent recommendations. Um, the things that the ALM study for us, um, are driving, which are getting the target, which is for us, it feels more important. Um, and some of the other systems. And so I invite Matt to talk about PE in particular and 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 how we thought about balancing getting the target, um, some of the the pacing and some of the pipeline with BAM with the conviction in those funds. Sure. Thanks, Antonio. So I think we've talked about it in the past and, and you touched on it that uh, you know the approach isn't changing. The strategy isn't changing. If we don't have high conviction in the manager, you know, we, we've passed. And you've you've identified the managers there, and if you don't, uh, there was another manager you didn't get your minimum commitment, um, and and uh, we decided to pass on that one as well. So if you're passing on a handful of deals, and we have not had the ability to uh, do things off of the menu, um, I think that you've laid the groundwork for that ability going forward. So I feel good about 2022 for that reason, and because the pipeline is extremely full. Uh, but I, I think we tried to increase commitments where we could. So higher, convict, higher conviction managers trying to get larger bite sizes. And also on the emerging manager side, if there's a manager that we liked a lot, we, we'd try to get a, a little more where we could. Uh, those were on the margin and, and you know, we still came up a little short, but I think we were all pretty happy to still be within the, the bands that you've established. And, and one thing to balance out the, um, you know, on the one hand, again, passing on a couple managers, but on the other hand, what establishing establishing the minimums has done, right? So that we do have to balance those out. Where um, certain managers, we we almost we would not have gotten even the 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 twenty five million dollars in those in some of those cases without having established those minimums. And so it's balancing out the uh, um, you know the fact that you know sitting our convictions on both ends. So, so it gives in the sense of being able to to um, progress more to our target on a per manager basis, but it also takes away um, in the sense that we want to, we we are we want to be more selective. And I think net net, um, it ends up being like without the minimums, um, but 
doing every manager. I'm not 100% sure. We might, I think we probably end up in the, around the same place, uh, maybe even less, uh, just because in some cases, our minimum is double what we would have gotten on a pro rata basis. So um, let's go to, uh, to 2022 and then I'll let Matt um, uh, take over after I go through the, the, the from a high level. Still using 7% as our assumed rate of return. So the only system doing that. Our target commitment to private equity, we're targeting 335 million. Um, and uh, real estate, you see here, uh, private credit and, and infrastructure. Um, actually, I'd actually rather have Matt. Matt, I'll let you share your screen to, to go through um, how we kind of got to these numbers. Um, and then um, let me stop sharing now. Um, and so you can answer kind of the questions around um, uh, pacing for this year. All right, let me know when you can see this. <clears throat> yeah. Good. You good? So I'll, I'll quickly run through, you know, the, the four asset classes that we cover, private equity, uh, infrastructure, uh, real estate, and real assets. And then we can, you know, any questions we can take with any direction you want to go. So, uh, just starting with, with private equity, uh, the private equity program really started in 2005. Um, and since that time, BRRRS has committed over a billion dollars to 100 funds. So, very well diversified, you can even say overly diversified. Uh, but in aggregate, th that portfolio has generated 14.4% return. So, absolute basis, we, we think performance is, is very good. Um, <clears throat> And Tony mentioned that, uh, you know, we already talked about the 275 uh, goal last year, 2022, the pacing has came out uh, about 20% higher. So we'll target 335 million for private equity in 2022, uh, 300 million of that. Uh, and let me just <clears throat> pull up the uh, pacing so you can see the visual. So uh, this pacing exercise is it's an important aspect of the planning process uh, because of the nature of private equity um, you know, you're making a commitment, that commitment isn't invested right away. So it's not, it's not immediately turned into NAV or market value. The, you make the commitment, it's drawn over time, but you're also getting distributions back over time. So we've developed a model that uh, estimates how, when capital will be called, how it will be distributed, how the market value will grow, and then very importantly, how the total uh, pension size will grow. So Antonio mentioned the, the 7%, and the, that's what you, the, that's what you see here in this illustration. Um, basically, we have the 9% target, and if we're committing $335 million a year and growing the total plan size by 7%, the goal is to get to that 9% and, and level off. I mean, that 9% that is, is what the board has established. Uh, I think Sandy and Antonio have, have stressed it's probably one of the biggest decisions the boards make, and it's our job to help you get to that. 9%. So we run multiple scenarios, whether it's 5%, 3%, but then we also stress test it. And this is important because you do have bands, you know, 9% target, but it's plus or minus 4%. So the question this answers is, what would it take for you to be outside your band? And the answer, and I know it looks like a spaghetti chart, but the answer is if the total plan size Decline by 30% in, in a year, then we think there's a possibility you, you could be outside of, of the range. Um, hopefully, that's a, a low likelihood event. And if that happens, we do have the ability to adjust over time. Because this, under this scenario, it shows still investing 335 million, but we can tweak that down, and we're doing this annually. So, again, the pipeline for private equity is full. Uh, we had our planning session with BAM um, a couple weeks ago, and we just, uh, talked about 60 different funds that are uh, high quality, uh, good managers, and we're basically triaging uh, which ones we want to uh, dig deeper in and, and diligence. So I feel good about 2022 um, and, and getting to 335. Uh, let, <clears throat> I don't know if you want me to stop there and see if there's any questions about private equity or if you want me to go on to uh, infrastructure. Um, see if there's any questions, but um, otherwise it can run through the rest of the asset classes. Matt, what is uh, driving that um, the pipeline? Why is it so rosy all of a sudden? 
Uh, Rosie, it, it's managers are coming back to market really quickly. And, and managers, we typically say they come back three to four years, and some of them are coming back every two years. And, and so we've kind of hit a point where there's some managers who should be coming back now, and there's some are coming back really early. And it's a lot of the existing managers and a lot of high quality managers. There's just a ton of private equity activity. Um, we're seeing deal volume at you know, record highs. Distribution levels are also high. So that they're, they're not just putting the money to work, they're also selling, and it could be selling to each other, but there's just a lot of activity. There any inherent risk in all of that? Just sounds like, um, you know, a, a, a very hot market, which could also bring some. I don't know what, you know, I'll let you. It is. Yeah, we, we've done a lot of work around timing and trying to time the market and, and private equity. You really can't. So if you make a commitment now, those dollars will be put to work over multiple years. So if you say. I, I think 2023, 24 is not going to be a good year. Um, th that's just no one has that ability to, to, to foresee that. So we've, we've done studies and we found if you keep a consistent investment pace, you're better off than trying to time the market cycles. It's easy to agree with Matt, but I think that's your I mean, question, Natalie. <laughs> It, it's yeah, it, it's the value. I, I'm, valuations are high and I, I do like seeing the amount of distributions. That means a lot of the GPs are taking advantage of the high valuations and selling. But capital is also being put to work um, in at high valuations as well. Well, 1 of the 1 of the questions that uh, Antonio and I, and I think Michael Wright have shared is. How much of the sale transactions are going into uh, new PE funds? Right, so how much is internecine M and A between funds, and um, that's something I think is worthy of watching. And uh, you know, it's one of those things that the basket clause is a detriment, but it might also be a help. Well, the thing I'll add on that, I think it's you know we can well, is that um, everything is expensive. Everything, right? Or, 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 you know, kind of the new normal. And so, you know, it just feels like there's no, there's generally no place to hide, it, right? And I think that's kind of the, you know, um, I think the issue around the private markets, obviously, is that there's no place to hide. Valuations are rich and it's expensive, right? From just a, a participation perspective, but from a, I think, evaluation perspective, um, we're, right? Like it's, it's sort of, you know, it, it, it look, it's one of the good problems in the sense of even if you look at something like this where um, you know, we, we were playing around with some of the numbers. We drop our discount rate to five percent. We'd still be a hundred percent funded. We drop our our assets by thirty percent. We still look okay, right? And that's the crazy part, right? Like that's the part that is um, difficult to uh, kind of wrap our heads around, given the, our, our latest kind of funded ratio. Um, so it's it's scary, but it's not as scary. I'd be a lot more scared um, if we were in some of the other systems position, um, which is it's a you know I think is you know not not to that's not the answer your question directly in the sense of yeah i think there is you know valuation risk all over um but the fact that they have been sending cash back gives us a little bit more uh, um a little bit a little bit more comfort <laughs> and we would and and we would have made the same comments last year and the year before i mean valuations have just been high for a long period we're in a long you know bull market long cycle um i, I can't tell you when it's going to end so we, we think a consistent investment pace is the is the way to go. And just in terms of the allocation, the increase, as Sandy mentioned, the basket cause. I, I, are we taking away from something else to do this, or does this is it because our overall size is so big now that fifteen percent allows us to do more? The latter. Yeah, de definitely the the latter. I would say that um, it, it's kind of it's it's weird, right? We are, you know, there was a time last year, like last calendar year, where we were under six billion dollars. Um, you know, po right around co post COVID, we were at five nine or five eight, right? And now we're at we're you know eight nine nine billion. 
Um, I think that's that's really it, right? And, and so there's there's more. We certainly have more capital. Um, typically, the, the the P has historically come from um, domestic equity, so it is adding to the basket. The one other thing with um, what gives us a little bit more basket room is that um, you know right now we have eighteen percent um, in international in some capacity, maybe a little bit less, seventeen percent, and so um, that acts as another stabilizer as that goes down. Uh, that actually frees up some basket room, so we do have some um, bit of stabilizers, but most of this capital comes directly from um, uh, uh, domestic equity. Great, thank you. And the, but the target isn't changing. The nine percent target that that's the same as it was. Um, so it, it you know it, it is a function of the increasing total plan size that we're so that that's why the the absolute dollars are going up by twenty percent. And then I guess I'll shift over to infrastructure, Antonio, if that works for you. So uh, infrastructure, you've established a 4% target. Um, BERS has committed about 350 million to 24 infrastructure managers uh, since inception, uh, excuse me, 24 funds managed by 11 uh, managers. <clears throat> Aggregate net IR, very strong, 12.7% net, uh, which is significantly outperforming uh, the benchmark. Uh, current market value is at about 170 million or about 2% of the portfolio. So there's, there's room uh, to grow here. Um, I'll show the illustrations. So still, still well below target. Uh, 2021, we established 125 million. We ended up making four commitments and intentionally going slightly over the 125, so we did 140 million to, to four commitments. And, and we are comfortable with that because you're still well below the, the target. For 2022, um, the target will increase to 180 million, called plus or minus 40 million. So we'll target three to five deals anywhere in the 40 to $60 million each range. Um, and then the, I guess the only, one of the only new things um, for 2022 will be the co-investment program. So the co-investment program was approved by the board. I think we've, we've, we're getting all of the, our ducks in a row in, in terms of uh, diligence from, from Axia and hopefully when, when Petya and her team um, bring the first co-investment, we'll be ready to go. But co-investments from their team, you know, we'll expect to see one, maybe two co-investments a year. So it's not going to, Move the needle, but we, we think it's a, it's a good start, important aspect to have. It, it, it's one of those things that will help you lower the, your fees over time. So you'll, you'll be the funds that you're investing in, you'll be able to, they'll bring you a co investment and no fee, no carry. BAM will underwrite it. We'll execute the, the diligence. Antonio and, and the Burr staff will be able to review it, and then we can move forward based on, based on that. Any questions on infrastructure? Hey, Matt, I'm looking at the um, various bunch of documents in front of me. I think maybe the annual pacing went up 5 mil from 175 to 180. I'm seeing 175, I think. So I, I, you know, it's minor, but I'm just curious. Yeah, I think that the the target last year was actually 125, and, and maybe that's what you said. And then the uh, target he's, he's talking about on mine. will be increasing. Sorry, Matt. He's thinking, he's talking about on also, my, yeah. mine. Yeah, mine. I'm looking at I'm looking at it on your your sheet, Antonio, your cheat sheet, as well as um, on the uh, the documents that are circulated through BAM. So it just looks like it was no, I, no, that, that, no. That's my fault, actually. I, I said 125, and I wrote 125 in my notes. It was 175. No, that's, I'm sorry. That's, that's, I'm looking at the wrong year. Let me look at, let me pull up 21. Yeah, I have, for, again, for infrastructure, I'm looking at last year, 125. Yeah. This year, 175. You're showing obviously it's a very minor, you know, it's like a, <clears throat> excuse me, maybe like a two and a half percent change, but 
I just want to make sure I'm looking at the latest that we're approving. Yeah. You, you are. So the absolute dollar, it's the same as, as private equity. The absolute dollars will increase from 125 target to 175. Um, the 4% target doesn't change. We're just trying to get to that. Okay. So we're only at about 2% now. So we're increasing, we're increasing the amount of dollars because of the increase in the, in the denominator, the pension fund size. All right, thanks. Does that make sense, Russ? So the target for infrastructure is 180 or 175? Oh, your question is between 175 and 180? Um, it is 175. Thanks. And we, and we put bands around that, and we'll say plus or minus forty million. So that's of course, uh, of course, it's a, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a minor play. We can that we can really, really okay. Um, but you know, three to five deals is what we expect. Um, that's consistent with bands targeting, and, and we think it's appropriate as well. So let me just jump over to the real estate. So current market current market value in real estate is about 434 million or about a little over five percent of the fund. Target is eight percent, and that uh, so since inception, you've committed over 700 million to 49 funds. The performance of, of in aggregate, the performance is 9.7 percent net. And real estate is split into two buckets. It's uh, core and core plus are in one bucket. This is really the lower risk profile, low risk lower return profile. And then you have the opportunistic and value add bucket. And the goal is, is to have these split fairly evenly. Um, over time, they've grown differently. So for 2022, let me pull up the pacing. This is the illustration of, of the pacing for just the core, core plus to get to 4%. So we're saying it, uh, targeting 80 million for 2022, will get you to your 4% target around 2025, 2026, and then level off. That's our goal, is to get to that number and, and, and maintain the, the, the target allocation. Um, again, multiple scenarios. Antonio talked about the 7%, but if you're interested in seeing what it looks like at 5% or 3%, it's basically saying your total pension grows a little slower, so you really do one less deal per 200 basis points. Um, so that's the, the, the core, looking at the uh, non-core, the target is about 120 million. So combined about 200, 200 million. Themes here, um, we are trying to make larger commitment to fewer managers. We've been stressing that in, in, in private equity and, and in real estate as well. Um, You'll continue to hear about industrial and, and logistics funds in 2022, very hot area. Um, there's, there's some managers coming back to market that we think are, are very good in, in both those areas. Uh, you also have a co-investment program um, that's with LaSalle. So it's a little different than the infrastructure. It's outsourced to LaSalle. But any deals that come in from your managers are then farmed out to LaSalle. They underwrite them and, and execute on the co-investments. And then the, I think the only other area I'd, I'd mentioned we'll focus on a little bit is uh, Europe. Uh, so as it stands, this is a, a snapshot of where the, the portfolio stands today. Um, we, we've set long-term targets for Europe between 10 and 20% of the portfolio, and you're just below that now. So I think uh, identifying a, a good European manager in 2022 is, is something we'll, we'll look to do. Um, yeah, but other than that, yeah, the goal is to get to the half core, half half non core, and um, we think 80 in in the core bucket, 120 in the non core bucket for 2022 is uh, is the goal. 
And then last but not least is the credit. Put the on the real estate for you real quick as well. Sure. sure. So go back to the real estate for a second. I'm just, um, this is like, I think the one area of private markets that is actually declining uh, as far as our targeting commitments is that, could you just comment on like the reasoning there? Obviously we had like a hundred last year, we're down to 80 and four this year. I think non-core is staying pretty steady. Uh, I, I guess I'm just curious if you could comment on the, yeah. is that because we've gotten a lot of deployments out the door? Is that uh, incorporate the investment that we're considering later it's, today? It's, Go ahead. It, it, it's really a function of the modeling itself. So we made some tweaks to the real estate model and, and because of that, the, the growth rates of, of the real estate investments have uh, come down a little bit. So it, it's really a modeling exercise thing and what we feel are the appropriate uh, assumptions in that model. So when you look at private equity infrastructure, those changes were driven by the denominator. You think it would, it would apply to all the asset classes, but because we made tweaks to our long-term return assumptions for, for real estate, that is, is one of the driving uh, factors in really maintaining. So it, it, it's basically saying the denominator pension fund size and the return assumptions offset each other and, and we'll, we'll target pretty similar pace uh, as last year. Got it, um, okay. Go ahead, Antonio. Uh, yes, one, one other thing, although I, I will say that um, even though I don't want to say the majority, since these are long-term projections, um, um, so you know, uh, kind of a steady-state projection over the, uh, over a few years, I do think that the the um, investment that we are contemplating in core plays a little role. I, I would say Matt is correct, and the majority of it is is that because it's our long-term projections, looking at the modeling and those assumptions. The reason I say it, pay, it plays a little bit of a role is because um, we are recommending an additional allocation to an open-ended fund, which will have hopefully, you know, depending on the queue, deployed a little faster. Um, and, and that came straight out of the asset liability study saying, are, what are the ways that we can get to our target allocation more quickly? And when we talked with Matt and the, the team at Axia, one of the things we're saying, if we're going to use our, like, more of our kind of closed and funded commitments on, you know, value add versus kind of the, the core um, real estate managers, because again, our, our take is, um, our job is as, as much as possible is to to um, execute on the the strategic asset allocation I was given. And so, um, in some ways, core is a, a lot easier to get kind of a broad based access to than than non core. And so, again, I think Matt is 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 right that the majority of it is that. But the I would say the the um, allocation that we're recommending to you today is um, plays a a smaller portion. Got it. And I, and I guess you, you touched briefly on the work, you know, the sectors and the fact that industrial is so hot right now. Um, is there a folk, I mean, you also mentioned the European under allocation. Is there an intention to, to focus at all on uh, industrial funds as opposed to office or apartment or retail? Or is it still, I yeah, hope to yeah, look at I, I think, yeah. funds? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I, I think, I mean, there's, there's, there's managers uh, in uh, multifamily, but I think industrial logistics is a really interesting area. Problem is, there's a lot of capital being thrown at these industrial logistics managers. So that's always the question in the back of my mind. And, and while we conduct our diligence is, are we entering a market at a peak? And, and, and really what we're trying to do is identify managers that have the operational expertise to, to go in there and, and buy right, you know, whether it's add-ons or, or uh, that's more on private equity, but it's, it's managers who have been through multiple cycles. They've seen this. It's not just going into, you know, first time industrial logistics fund. That's just not what we're, we're looking for. So it's looking at their track record over multiple cycles, understanding, do they have the ability to buy right? Just a few of the, the variables that are in our diligence process. Yeah, thanks for that color. Appreciate it. Uh, 
And then private credit, uh, you know, the newest of, of the allocations, uh, it's weighted average age is less than two years, so it's a performance isn't quite meaningful yet. Um, you do have a 5% target that you established. We're about two, getting close to 2% now. Um, similar pace as, as, uh, as last year, you know, a little over 200, 200 million. Um, in the past, we, we've, you know, past two years, what we've done is we, we've taken a look at New York City's existing SMAs, and we've joined quite a few of them. And I think there's probably, there might be one additional SMA that, that we'll consider um, in 2022. But I, I think in a large part, we've already identified the ones we are interested in moving forward with. And uh, most of the, the commitments going forward will probably be typical fund structures, closed on fund structures. And the one area that, the one change I'd say from, from last year is that we've increased the direct lending target. So I think we initially established a 20 to 40% target, but we've tweaked that to up to 40 to 60%. And that's a function of working with Antonio and the team and understanding your risk appetite and uh, the funding status. So you, you don't need to take as much risk in this private credit portfolio. We think increasing the direct lending uh, exposure uh, is prudent here. So that's, you'll see more direct lending uh, in 2022. Um, we already have some good managers in direct lending, but the way we typically board, build portfolios is you start with your, uh, the core of the portfolio should be direct lending, and then the, uh, we call them satellite investments, are more opportunistic, distressed debt, uh, mezzanine, and we've actually started with those first, and we're kind of backfilling the direct lending. So we did a little backwards, but I think in the long run, it, you'll, you'll see the direct lending be the anchor, the, the core of the portfolio. So we'll target likely five deals in, in 2022. Um, and then the goal is to get to the, the target in around 2025, 2026, and maintain it at 5%. Any questions on the credit? Yeah, Matt, if you could just circulate this plan as well. I don't think I have this one in the SIM materials. I would be curious to also look at it. Thank you. Sure, happy to. Thanks. And it's you know, similar to the other ones, we've, you know, multiple scenarios. But yeah, we can send this. Yeah, through. absolutely. Presentation, the, these presentations are extremely detailed and thorough and helpful. So I appreciate having the opportunity. So in aggregate, uh, in alts, we're looking at about 925 million across the four asset classes. Um, any other questions um, for uh, Matt on private markets, for um, Vanessa and Mike on, on public markets um, before we go to executive session? Right, hearing none. Um, I said I, on the agenda before we had had performance. I um, just this was to kind of go over, um, you know, given the volatility that it somewhat come back into the markets a bit. Um, you know, was going to talk a bit about where we stand. I think that's still appropriate for next month, given given the time period, and wanted to get you guys done before three o'clock. Um, so uh, we'll skip that for now and and do our regular performance reporting at the uh, end of the uh, quarter. So uh, in January. Um, so for now, then I'd ask for if there's no other comments, I'd ask for a motion to enter executive session to discuss um, potential investment managers and funds. So little drops. Thank you, Russ. Is, is that Isaac it? second. Thank you, Isaac. Any discussion? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Isaac, right. aye. Any opposed? Right. Any abstentions? If the motion carries. Uh, we are now in executive session. Okay, um, I might be zoomed the recording, Antonio. You right. may go ahead. All right, thank you, Karen. So, the report out from executive session. In executive session, the, the, the board heard a presentation on a private equity fund. Board also had a presentation on uh, a, a real estate fund.
The board also heard an update on a previously approved private equity fund. Um, that's the last item that we have on the agenda. Um, so I can now ask for a motion to adjourn. So moved, Russ. Thank you, Russ. Is there a second? Michael. Thank you, Michael. Um, any discussion? All right. All those in favor of adjourning, please say aye. 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 Isaac, aye. 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 Any opposed? Thank you. We are adjourned.